this 1885 period is when uh, is when a massacre occurred in Rock Springs, and I'm going to focus on that, but I want to focus on several things that led up to it, and I'm going to look at specifically the Chinese inside of Wyoming. Um, for some reason, I'm not able to advance. <clears throat> Bottom one? Sorry, hit the no. down button. Yeah. Just bear with me one second. One second. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so I'm going to break out the chronology, and if we'll just follow through with the chronology on this, um, uh, we'll, we'll share the screen here in a second. So if the period of time that we're going to look at is from 1869 to 1974 at first, and that's when Chinese immigrants are recruited to work in Western Wyoming College, or Western Wyoming, I said the college, <laughs> uh, on the railroad and in Western coal mines. So they built a railroad too fast through Wyoming. And it began to sink. It literally sank into the ground. And so they had to come in and rebuild it. They got paid for each mile that they laid of track. They didn't get paid for quality. So it had to be rebuilt. So they recruited uh, Chinese to work both on rebuilding the railroad and to open the mines. In 1875, there was a Chinatown constructed by Union Pacific Coal Company at Rock Springs in, partially, in, in part because of the fact it was agreed upon in a contract that they would be provided housing. Anybody that's lived in Wyoming for any period of time know that it's windy and cold all the time. Uh, on September 2nd, 1885, the Chinese miners were attacked and 28 were killed uh, in what's considered to be labor strife, but I'll break down why that happened. There's multiple reasons. If you ever find one just answer to a thing, you found the wrong answer. Um, <laughs> uh, Chinatown is burned to the ground on that day on the 2nd of September, 1885. And then between September 6th and 8th, the Chinese were forcibly returned back to Rock Springs. They were loaded into a freight car and brought back to Rock Springs and told to go back in the mines and, and, and mine coal. They couldn't run the railroad without the coal. It was essential for the operation of the, uh, of the railroads. And because of that, you couldn't go on strike. You couldn't stop working because that's just the way it was at that particular time. It still is today. Uh, Chinatown is rebuilt quickly within one month. It actually spans two months. And at the same time, Camp Pilot Butte for the Army is built right beside Chinatown because part of the agreement for returning the Chinese to Rock Springs is that a military fort would be built right beside them to protect the Chinese from other individuals. Um, in 19, between 1912 and 1913, uh, the, start of the, China, the, the start of the Chinatown's demise began by subdivision. So it was sold off and broke down. And so the Chinatown does not stand and there are only one building in town left from the original Chinatown that was in the 1890s. So therefore, because of that, we have to, whoop, so it's still not advancing. Yeah, you just have to hold it there. Right. Have this okay. okay so, uh, which is the advanced key? Right, there we go. All okay. Right. You can just so, tell me click and then I'll... Okay, all right, thanks. So we're gonna look at the Rock Springs Chinatown and we're gonna look at how the Chinese got there. And then we're gonna look at the archeological record that they left because none of the buildings are left the only thing that we have that can help us understand what the Chinese did was look at it through the archaeological record. The oral histories don't exist because very few people spoke uh, Chinese. Some of the other traditional records that you have for reconstructing people's lives do not exist. And the written record is scattered, but it is actually richer than what one would think. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to look at how these people got to Wyoming and where they came from. And they primarily came from one county called Taishin. Not totally from Taishin, but primarily from one county in Southern China, Taishin. Next slide, please. Uh, it's very verdun, it's very green. It's the antithesis of what Rock Springs is, which is high desert. It looks a lot like Page. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you can see this particular ceramic bowl that we have right here. They were a very ordered society. They brought with them their, their bowls and their teacups from China, and they left parts of their lives in Rock Springs. They always say that at a crime scene, you take something and you leave something. In other words, if you leave a piece of your clothing, you leave even your dandruff. Now you, they can do genetics on it. But you take something, and you leave something. The same thing with any time you visit a site. You take something from that site, you leave something at that site, whether it's the dirt on the soles of your shoes or whether it's something else, you always leave something there and you always take something away. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, try the down arrow again. Okay, there we go. This is Taishin. This is, this is the Verdun area that I'm telling you about. The reason I'm showing you this is to contrast it against what Rock Springs was like. 
they had to sail 7,000 miles from Southern China to just get to San Francisco. And they not only transitioned to great distance, they transitioned to great distance in culture and in, in place and things that they had to live with. It was an unfamiliar place. There's plenty of water inside of uh, 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 Taishin. There's, you can grow things year round. You have to suffer from typhoons, but the typhoons are something that people learn to live with because they're on the Pearl River estuary. And it's extremely popula populated. The majority of those leaving for North America came from a region called CD. Uh, there's a man by the name of Gordon Cheng that writes wonderful histories of the Chinese and calls them the CD people. Over 200,000 people left this particular area and came to uh, the new world to work. Some say that the 200,000 are just from one county, but actually it's from the four counties. And they're in the southwest of Guangzhou in the Pearl River Delta region. The four counties include Xinyi, Taishan, Inping, and Kaiping, and provide the lion's share of immigrants to the new world. Now, understand I'm going to butcher these words. Uh, I went to Southeast Asia when I was 19 as the gift of the United States government, and I had to go across the Pacific Ocean in a boat. Never seen an ocean, never seen a boat. And the first thing that I did was get off the ship, and I couldn't understand a thing that anybody said to me. And I learned that the language that I had been learning was Mandarin. And that did not work in Southern China because Cantonese is spoken there, but not in Taishin. Taishinese is spoken there. So you have three different veneers or four different veneers of language that you have to be able to try to meld together. Cantonese, Taishinese, Mandarin, because that's currently the Kukun Wa, and that's where things are, way things are pronounced today in English. So studying Southern China is very difficult as it is anywhere else. This right here is Hong Kong, and this is Macau. Macau is the first place that Europeans settled in the Pearl River uh, Delta, and Hong Kong came somewhat later. I always joked that in 1885, there were more people in Rock Springs than there was in Hong Kong, not so, but it was a very small town that became larger and larger over time because of the trade with the United States. This is the, the, this is the Delta itself, uh, again, in access to one of the rivers off of the Delta. Taishin sits just to the west of Macau, and it sits at the end of the Pearl River estuary. I'll show you another map. This is in Chinese, of course, right here, but you can see Canton up here at the top. You can see Hong Kong down here at the bottom, Macau here, and then Taishin sits just to the left of that particular location. Now, I always show this map because of the fact that we live, live in deserts, walk places. This has taken the water off the Pacific Ocean. You see, this is a pretty big walk <laughs> to get there. Um, it's it, it's 7,000 miles, and it took two months, depending on what kind of ship you went on, and it was frightening. If you've never been out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you never can understand how high the waves can get. They'll get 20 to 30 feet high. It's in, it, it, You lose orientation. And they had never sailed any, across anything as large as the Pacific Ocean, and yet they came. And why did they come? that I'll talk about in just a moment. In archeological research, we use a wide array of material remains and cultural anthropology to answer what our research questions. And in historical archeology, span we add to that database by using a wide variety of historical sources to address the questions of what, when, why, and where. Um, and that's basically what I wanna to try to address here. Here we'll use data from Rock Springs Chinatown's excavations, refiner analysis of food waste, but also look at the Rock Springs Chinese community's survival and tenacity. And we'll actually spend more time looking at the tenacity and the survival with inside of the Rock Springs Chinatown. Leos came from Shibu village in Taishin, and they made up 42% of the population inside of Rock Springs in 1885, 42%. 42% of the people killed in the Rock Springs massacre in 1885 were from this particular village. Of the 731 Chinese living in Rock Springs, like I just said, 42% were Leos. And they came from one small area just north of Taishan City in Taishan. Taishan City sits right about here in the Sanyi counties. On the, on the map, these are divided into the counties in the Gu uh, Guangdong province. Guangdong is the southernmost province and is one of the more richer provinces in all of China. And it always was because it had good food sources. But at the time that the Chinese began to immigrate to the new world, they left Shibu because of the fact that it was suffering from economic downturns. There had been famine, there was political turmoil and they had a very difficult time making a living. So the push was, we can do better. 
the pull was people were talking to them back from California and they were talking to them back from uh, the States. And they said, you can make a living here. You can absolutely make a good living in this place in the United States. Now, why I like Page is it sits on the Colorado River and the Colorado River drains Rock Springs by a Bitter Creek. <laughs> so uh, on the banks of the Bitter Creek was Chinatown. On the banks of the Bitter Creek, Chinatown was created. And it's in the Colorado River drainage basin system. And as I've mentioned before, it's high and dry. When the Union Pacific built its railroad, it had to come back and repair. And every six miles, they put a section camp where they put railroad workers. So we have worked on these railroad section camps exclusively. So this is Green River, Rock Springs is this point, one more point to the, to the east here. We have worked at Granger, Church, Buttes, Hampton, Carter, and I could go through the whole list, but we've done extensive excavations at Aspen, and we've done extensive excavations at Evanston on the Chinese communities at these uh, uh, localities. Rock Springs is inside of the Rock Springs uh, basin, and I don't know that I can do this. I hope I can do this with, with my hands, but used to the entire area back in the eons ago was like Louisiana, a big marsh, and what happens, it was at like 32 degrees latitude, and it began to lift up and move north. The whole North American continent's moving up, and it folded like my knuckles did. The plate's so hard at Rock Springs that it didn't buckle and form the Rocky Mountains. The whole area that you see right there is part of the Rocky Mountain provi provenance, and it contains vast quantities of coal. In that uplifting that occurred, when this was uplifted in that swamp that put a lot of this pressure, this is a lot of time, this transpired less than the time that I described it. When it exposed this coal right here, it was some of the best coal ever found in the United States. It was low in sulfur and high in British thermal units. It was excellent, it was superior. It didn't break down when you put it in the, in the box of the locomotives, you could make good steam from it. And so therefore they opened mines at Rock Springs, at Carbon, which is over in, in this county here, and at Evanston. But there wasn't enough people to work there. It was the first place that a transcontinental railroad had been built where there were not people there. There were not enough people to build a railroad, there were not enough people to mine the, the coal. And it's not that good of a living unless you like wind. If you like wind, it's a good place to go. <laughs> but not very many people are really prone to like the wind. Gene Larson just raised her hands. Yes. Me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, it, but, so in this particular case, they had a lot of difficulty in finding people to come to work. The first group of people they used were Irish railroad workers, but the Irishmen wanted to go home, not to Ireland, but wanted to go back east where they had more relatives. They wanted to find something that was more amenable to working and that paid a little bit better than coal mine. There was a difficult time in finding railroad workers for the coal mines. So then what happens is they begin to re recruit Chinese workers. This is uh, Rock Springs Chinatown in about 1894, a little bit later than this. But the Chinese immigrants were first recruited to work on the railroad, then the coal mines at Almy, which is near Evanston in Wyoming territory between 1869 and 1871. This photograph of Chinese workers is at Echo, which is to the uh, west of Evanston. And what's really funny in the early territorial records, they put Wasatch in some of the Utah towns inside of Wyoming. They were trying to goat rope and steal them from the Utah territory <laughs> at that particular point in time. Didn't work, but they tried. Um, the way the wind blows. Now, nationwide, this was like, you know, you need to have something that drives a nation or makes people feel like they're behind something. Nationwide, it was advertised that there was now a connection between Hong Kong, Honolulu, San Francisco, and New York connecting to London via the railroad line. The railroad line became the link that they were advertising and touting is making it easier to cross around the world, get on the railroad and see the world. It probably was still better to go through the Panama Canal, but you suffered with malaria. They had a railroad built through the Panama Canal by this time, but it was not the way to go. The Transcontinental Railroad provided the way to ship goods all the way across the nation. So the geographical relationship of New York, Europe, Asia, with views of Hong Kong, Honolulu, Aspenwall, Panama, and the Pacific Railroad was in Harper's Weekly in 1868. They were trying to enthrall people or make them see the viability of this commercial venture that they'd set, apart, set, set out on to build this railroad. This individual here is a man by the name of Osse, and he enters Wyoming territory in 1869. He came to the United States in 1857 from Taishin and he's a Leo. 
What he did was learn English very rapidly and he had country fellows back in Cebu and he wrote to them and said, come here. Union Pacific and then later Beckwith and Quinn would pay him a dollar a head for each person that he could bring. And some people say that that enriched him, but technically that didn't enrich him because if he brought his country fellows, his cousins, his uncles, his brothers, and other people from that village, he was responsible for their well being and for taking care of them when they came to the new world. But because he is a Leo, his name is Leo Wing Jan, and because of the fact that he had recruited these people, he, the whole area filled up with one particular group of people, all pretty much related. The 52% that aren't related to them in town are closely related and from place nearby. But because of um, Ase, who is more commonly called Ase, Leo Wing, uh, Leo, uh, Leo Wing Jan, the people in Rock Springs came from one particular location and began to work in this area. Okay, this man in 1874, Leo Chung, went to work in the coal mines in Rock Springs in 1874 prior to the active recruiting of Chinese miners into Rock Springs. 1875 is when Ase began to actively recruit to bring miners into Rock Springs. And he was instrumental in writing the contract, later on he would write another contract, but he was instrumental in writing the contract with a company out of Evanston, Wyoming called Beckwith and Quinn that ensured that these Chinese had houses. Now, uh, you can read this as, as I talk right here, but the one thing about this is, is that there became a myth that Union Pacific was providing them with free housing. They was providing them with the free water. No, they had to pay for that. They had to pay for their tools from Beckwith and Quinn. They had to pay for their rent. But what's really intriguing is because they lived in groups together, there were 10 to 12 people in some of these houses and they shared expenses. They all saved, I shouldn't say all because we know people don't all do the same thing, but they mm -hmm. saved money to send home. But that was the reason that they came here is to help their families out at home. And uh, Ase was instrumental in this first process. This man, Leo Chung, came before the others, and yet he becomes instrumental, and I'll talk about him a little bit later. He would live in Rock Springs for 41 years. He lived through the Chinese massacre. He survived the Chinese massacre and stayed in this community where people had attacked, burned his house, and robbed him blind, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, this is Chinatown in the eight. This is Chinatown in the 1870s, early 1880s. It's very difficult to see, but I've enlarged it here in this picture here, and you can kind of see the houses are in rows, et cetera, like this. I'm going to provide focus on this house. These are the wooden structures that they built, and they all added add-ons. Basically, the Union Pacific provided this particular structure and then allowed them to add on. And what the Chinese did was dig under the houses. Because if you've got 10 to 12 people, and that's, a, that's proven in the census records, if you've got 10 to 12 people living in that one house, you can basically only cook and feed the people in there and take care of business. You have to sleep somewhere else, so they dug basements. This dirt along the outside of this structure is from the digging of the basement underneath this. This would have uh, ramifications later on, which I'll explain. But they uh, built, built the dirt up around the house to keep the wind out, because the one thing that you want to do is keep your house warm, and the best insulation is dirt. It has thermal retention properties so that when the sun shines on it, it acts as a passive solar reservoir. And besides that, the basement is, is good space for people to live in. This is the first map that we have of Chinatown and it comes from 1883. And this is the Chinatown right here. Notice it's isolated from the town proper, but right through here is where we would say that the people with less money lived. They lived in dugouts, they lived on the banks of Bitter Creek. The Chinatown was separated by maybe not even a quarter mile from where the dugouts were right here. But this is the old route of, of, of Bitter Creek. Here is what they called Suffer Mine or, or Rock Springs China, Mine Number Three. Right here is Rock Springs Number One. Number One would undermine this entire area here, and I'll show you a map of that in a moment. But it's only 100 feet below the surface at this point in time right now. It was excellent coal. It was some places 17 feet thick, some places 21 feet thick. It then depend on where you're at, but they never mined it out. It goes about one mile to the west, and it, it was the largest mine in the United States when it finally closed in the early 1900s. Uh, to answer why 28 men were murdered in Rock Springs on September 2nd, 1885, we need to look at the political climate and attitudes of the 1880s in Wyoming. And we'll stop for a second and talk. This is horrific. In archaeology, though, when something burns, it seals everything. It seals it to the ground level. 
The intriguing thing is that when they returned, something that's not going to be in these slides, when they returned, the military and the Union Pacific did not want people living in the basements because when they attacked on September 2nd, uh, 1885, people were trapped in the basements and died. So they were killed by the smoke that was in there. A lot of them were shot, but they were killed by the smoke that came in when, when, when they were attacked. So in this particular case, that sealed the entire town. It was leveled in 1885, basically two weeks after it all burned to the ground. And then they built on top of it again. But the Chinese again built basements, not in the same hole, because the fact that there would be ghosts inside of those basements, they wanted to make sure that the ghosts would not bother them or, or, or disrupt their happiness. But they did build the Chinatown essentially right back on top of where it was. This is a research thing, and I put it up here just to show that, that we did the research. But between 1867 and 1885, if you type in the word Chinese in the all Wyoming newspapers thing, there are 5,715 hits. Most of those hits come, and you can't see this very well, from Laramie County, where the capital is, that's in Cheyenne. And very few come from Sweetwater County. What's intriguing is, is the myth became that they wanted the Chinese to go. Yes and no, because people were so fluid in moving through uh, Evanston and Rock Springs, it was a transitory work world that they had. There was animosity and animus against the Chinese, but it never really reached a fevered pitch until after 1882. In 1882, the Chinese must go is published pretty broadly for political reasons. On May 6, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed by the US Congress, and that said that no Chinese laborers could immigrate to the United States. They stopped. And that act is only two pages long. It was signed by Chester Arthur on May 6, 1882. You could come if you were a merchant. You could come if you had technical skills to get to the United States, but you were not allowed to immigrate. And it changed the matrix of what happened. The Chinese Exclusion Act changed the way people viewed the Chinese. And therefore, in, in between 1867 and 1885, this, the Chinese must go only appears 30 times. Most of those are in the year 18, between 18, most of that is between the years 1882 and 1885. They say the Chinese must go, but there becomes a different dynamic. In the words of historian Irish Chang, far from appeasing the fanatics of not just wanting Chinese to come, the new restrictions inflame them. Having succeeded in barring the majority of new Chinese immigrants from American shores, the anti-Chinese bloc began to campaign to expel the remaining Chinese from the United States. So they begin to work not to keep them out, but to expel them, to completely remove the Chinese from any place that they were working. And the Knights of Labor become extremely involved in this. They're a labor union that forms in Rock Springs. On September 2nd, 1882, all but one house was burned to the ground in the Rock Springs Chinatown. 28 Chinese men were killed and 16 injured. And it's one of those things that just, it, it, it's terrible. It's the most written about event in Chinese history in Wyoming. There are theses, there are dissertations, there's all kinds of other things that are written about it. And in the process, what happens is that becomes a muted part of our history or it's understated. On September 2nd, from mine number six, the riot starts. Uh, people had gone underground to mine the coal and a guy by the name of Whitehouse and Jenkins had gone in and they'd undercut the coal and they drilled into the face of the coal. So the way that it works is here's the face right here of the coal. You undercut it and then you put blasting charges inside of it and then you run the cord out and then you blast it, it falls down, then you load it into the car, you take it to the surface and you get paid for it. Well, Whitehouse and Jenkins were under the mist mis idea, mis misinformed idea that they where they had been working the day before they would work that next day. They came to find two Chinese men working there that morning and they attacked and nearly beat them to death. So this happens at 830 in the morning. And what they do is they close the mines down because there's a panic. There's a riot basic, basically breaking down on the ground. They close the mine. So the, at this point in time, the Chinese return to their house in Chinatown, 830 in the morning. At four o'clock in the afternoon, the white men attack from town into Chinatown at four, three to four in the afternoon, and they seal them off, but the Chinese escape. Some go over the top of Burning Mountain, others go south and catch the railroad here, but they catch the railroad train and they go to Evanston, Wyoming. They were supposed to be joined by US troops in Evanston, Wyoming, and supposed to be helped. But here's the interesting thing about it. At Evanston, there's the town of Alma to the north, 
there are about 300 Chinese men with the 700 men that survived this attack that go to uh, uh, Evanston, there are 1000 Chinese men in Evanston. And there is a fear among other people that the, the residents of Evanston are gonna attack the Chinese. There were not enough men in Evanston to attack them. There are no military troops to protect the Chinese. They're taking agency in protecting themselves, but more every piece of clothing that they had all the money that they had in the world was inside of their houses. They didn't have enough time to get the money. They had nothing in the world. They had nothing to keep them warm. And this is September. They had no way of making it. But if they went to Evanston, then their country fellows could help them and they could survive through what was about to happen. Political cartoons at the time say, what a mess. And this one here, you can't read the bottom of it. But it says that this is not the way civilized people behave. Reportedly, 16 men were arrested. Uh, though there are 18 on the arrest record. So there are 16 men that arrested and I'm gonna slow down for just one second. This is an eyewitness account. It was given to the Chinese consulate. This was a big, this is a big mess. And the Chinese consulate comes and investigates it. And he does a really good job of investigating. And in this case here, there are several things that are said. It said the nationality of the men that attacked were Welsh, Cornishmen and Swedes and from other foreign countries don't know of any Americans being engaged in the trouble or attack. Myth number one, that's wrong. That's, that's, that's absolutely dead wrong. There were American born individuals that led this attack. Of course, there were people from Ireland and from England, which I'll talk about in a second. The might miners, miners wanted to fight the Chinese, but this was started by a man by the name of Isaiah Whitehouse and William Jenkins. Neither one of these men had been in Rock Springs very long. And later I'll talk a little bit more about Isaiah Whitehouse and talk about what happened to him, that they had not been in Rock Springs very long. They had become oriented to the union. And I hate to use this because my family is union workers and there's a whole lot of them inside of the, the family that are union workers. And I've got to be careful about this. But when I mean radicalized, they had become violent in their approach to labor negotiation. Instead of seeing something that could be worked out or maybe they could get better wages and they could come to a common ground, then maybe they could join together and they would actually be able to accomplish something with Union Pacific. Because they didn't speak the same language, this was an extreme barrier. Uh, the one thing that I thought about in Vietnam is I wonder what this person's telling me. I had no idea. And when you have no idea and there's no communication going on, a lot of mis misconceptions and mistakes can be made. And that's what happened. The two white men, as I've mentioned earlier, the, the, the two white miners beat the Chinamen in a terrible manner. And this took place about eight o'clock. And then we'll skip down here. About four o'clock, they attacked the town. What caused the massacre, in my opinion, now this is the opinion, this is, this is testimony taken by the Chinese consulate. So I would like to refer back to this because these are Chinese men interviewing these people to get their testimony. What caused the massacre, in my opinion, is wholly owing to the Chinese regime to go on strike and as long as Chinamen were employed. They didn't quite understand that I'll say and other people represented them in negotiation. When they came in and burned their houses, they went in and robbed them first. The total dollar amount of money stolen and property destroyed from the Chinese was $147,817 or $4,478,858 in today's dollars. Intriguingly, uh, this, this is provided by the, the consulate. Intriguingly, they went to each camp and they found out how much money each person lost. And there was censorship when they were going through it. So a person like uh, Kung Lee could not say, hey, I lost $1,000 there was censorship among the, the country fellows there to make sure that they accurately reported. But at this one particular house, when they say camp, they mean the house. So these are the people living in this house. They lost uh, 240. Uh, so the total for the camp, 43, I mean, not this, this person, total for the camp was 1,000. Lee Boot was killed. So they were able to make his estimate based on what they knew that he had. Okay, now the men that were arrested are right here in this list. And this is the Sweetwater County arrest record right here. And this is telling in itself. This man by the name of Whitehouse is Isaiah Whitehouse. And this man right here is Rick, Richard Kinnan. Now Kinnan, I'm gonna talk about in a minute as I am Whitehouse. I'm only taking two examples here to show you what happened. Okay, so here you see Whitehouse, here you see Kinnan on the arrest record. Okay, they're charged, Whitehouse is charged with riot, arson, murder, Riot, arson, murder, and robbery misspelled in the rest record. We could have got off on a technicality, but <laughs> they got off with not a technicality. Uh, Keenan was charged with riot, arson, murder, and robbery. Okay, after they went through the inquest, it's therefore found that these, that these men are released. 
basically I'm abbreviating it, but they were released without going to trial. They were seen to have murdered these individuals. They were seen to have robbed these individuals and yet they were released. And this became a big, a big problem. Uh, this is the graveyard where these Chinese men were buried to the north of town. Now, archeologically, this is very difficult to find, but these tombstones here that are in wood say that they're from Taishin. They say that they're from Taishin right at this point, okay? This right here, I need to back up. Uh, or just raise this. Okay, this right here is a prayer offering left to one of the people that were killed, but this is where they were buried. They were later moved um, and people would venerate the dead. They would come back and offer graves. Now, this is a new burial a little bit after the Chinese massacre, but the Chinese cemetery was active up until the turn of the century when they were disinterred and moved. Okay. The men who attacked were not all foreign born and some of these men profited handsomely from stealing money and goods before uh, they set the houses on fire. These are two men. This is Jenkins, who was said to be a foreigner. He was born in Louisiana. It says LA and unless he was born in Los Angeles, I'm pretty sure he was born in <laughs> LA, Louisiana. This particular fellow right here, Keenan was born in Pennsylvania, in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And we'll be careful about what we say here, but he's from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Now his parents were from Ireland. White House was born in England. White House was born in England and his family, uh, his family was coal miners and so was Keenan's family. They didn't have much money. You can understand why you come from Scranton, Pennsylvania to Rock Springs. You could work in the industry, you could work in coal. The same thing with a White House, he could come and work in something that they had a familiarity to with. They could work in the coal mines. They're coal miners. Um, it, it's pretty intriguing about this case. Now, this is one of the more intriguing things is that in all the research we did, we did not know that the Chinese had to pay taxes. They had to pay a poll tax. And this provides demographic information. This is the poll tax that Keenan had to pay in 1888. Uh, it says, it's, uh, so it says right here that he had to pay uh, $3. He's listed as a gentleman though. She's no longer listed as a coal miner. He's listed as a gentleman. How do you go from 1885 from being a coal miner to being a gentleman in 1888 that doesn't have to work with your hands? He does the wisest thing that a person can do in Rock Springs. He buys a bar. And by, <laughs> <laughs> and by 1889, he is worth $56,000. From coal mining to owning a saloon to ultimately becoming a state legislature and the, the mayor of Kimmer, the state legislature, Keenan's trajectory after the massacre financially is up. And the same thing can be said about Isaiah Whitehouse. Isaiah Whitehouse in 1866, 1886, was an elected representative to the territorial legislature in Cheyenne. He was the leader. Whitehouse is the prime mover in this whole process. He's the one that gets these people to think we need to drive them out, we need to do it forcefully. He whips them into a frenzy in several different cases. He intended to beat the guy to death with his hands in, in the ground. And they said it was with a needle. Henry Chatty, who was the historian for Sweetwater County, used to always say it was a needle, which is a long thing like this. They used to put the charges back in the back. He says it was a needle that they beat him with. It was severe. The guy almost died from that beating that he received. But White House serves in the territorial legislature. And this is he in the center right here. The intriguing thing is things got hot for him. And in the old days, when I used to I have a PhD in Western history and uh, from the University of Mexico, in the old days, they said the thing that the American West did was it absorbed a lot of narrative wells. They couldn't track you on Instagram. They couldn't track you on the telephone. They couldn't track you by telegraph. You could disappear. And if you were inclined and had a good spirit, you could reinvent yourself. And the intriguing thing about White House is I have followed him to where he went to. Two years after this event, he moved to Yakima, uh, Washington. And in his obituary, it said that he came by wagon train from Central City, uh, Colorado. His son, listed on the census record, was born in Rock Springs, right? And that is recorded through the census records through time in Yakima. So in Washington, you can see his son, it says born in Wyoming, and it's the same name and his wife is Miriam. You can track through them to the wife I think it was Miriam, it might be Kenyon's wife as Miriam. Sorry if I've made a mistake on that. But you could track through the wife and the children where he goes. Things, people don't change. But what's real intriguing is he does keep his standards of, of liking politics intact. He runs on the socialist ticket in Yakima in 1903. He gets 20 votes. 
I think it's because he has such a charming personality and he got those kind of books. In the case of what happened immediately, people tried to narrate the events of that day because of where the blame might be placed on September 2nd, they were, there was a quick attempt to write a narrative of what happened. The first to write was Territorial Governor Effie Warren. He had his report out within a month and Effie Warren needs to be given a lot of credit. Um, I'm not necessarily a fan of Effie Warren, but in this case, he needs to be given a lot of credit. If you've ever taught school, remember what they tell you to do. You go to the trouble. If you've got a troubled child in the classroom, you walk back and you talk to him. You don't talk to the class and say, now you children need to sit down. Walk back and say, you sit down. In this case right here, what Warren did was he got on a train and went to Rock Springs and he settled things down. Then he went to Evanston and they said that they were going to attack and kill the Chinese there. He formed a posse of 40 people. That posse of 40 people was there to protect the interests of those that lived there already. But Warren went to the problem and he constantly sent telegrams back east saying, send troops, send troops. It took five days, four to five days for troops to arrive in Rock Springs. And he got them to negotiate building Camp Pilot Butte to protect the Chinese right at that particular point. So he comes out with a publication about all the good deeds he does by November, 1885. Union Pacific Railroad comes out with a book. This is a re reissuing of it. By 1886, it talks about all the good things that they did. The House report talks about all of the grievances that are there with inside of Rock Springs, and that comes out in 1886. But the second quickest report is this one right here by a man by the name of Jew to the State Department. And he details in great detail how much was lost, who, who died, and everything else like this. So the Chinese consulate came to Rock Springs, set up a camp there, and took and did interviews of each of these Chinese people that had survived the massacre, and he wrote a report. He is right behind Warren getting his report, but his report doesn't see the light of day till late 1886. That way, these people have enough time to come out with what they're going to say and how they're going to dispel the, the, what occurred at this particular case. Like with all things, there are always things left behind, and that is where archaeology comes in. Now, all of this stuff right here is written and written about. But the real interesting thing about it is, is that Chinatown had to be rebuilt in two months and a fort had to be built right beside it. And what that does is it causes people to leave a lot of material on the ground that archeologists can find. We dedicate our life to digging through people's trash. Um, <laughs> here is the Chinatown that was built in 1885. Here is Camp Pilot Butte that was built that same year. And, and here is the, the so-called other people's town down here. What's intriguing is, is that Chinese have always lived and worked here, and right here on South, uh, South Front, they actually opened up a really elite restaurant called the Grand, uh, the Grand Cafe Grand Restaurant. It was, the, was one of the better restaurants on the south side of town. This right here shows Chinatown in 1904, the Union Pacific map. They had a mission house, they had a Josh house, they had a store, and then here's Cat Pilot Butte right here, and here's the Camp Hospital. There becomes a very interesting relationship between Camp Pilot Butte and Chinatown, and it, it evolves over time. The last troops that were stationed in Camp Pilot Butte left in February, 1899, and they were an African-American Corps. So an African-American infantry group that was stationed there at Camp Pilot Butte. This is the new Chinatown in 1896, and get to the archaeology pretty quickly here. There's a Chinese New Year in 1896 with a dragon. That dragon, the uh, Salt Lake City wanted this dragon to be in a parade and I'll say charged him $3,000 because they were going to take all the Chinamen down there, all the Chinese men down there with him to help display it. And they paid $3,000 in it. And I can't remember, I've got the newspaper article. Now this picture is phenomenal in several ways. You see the military and you see the bowler hats commingling with the Chinese. These are in Chinatown. Chinatown became a place to come and have a good time. I mean, you can figure out what your good time is, but it was a place where people, <laughs> where people came in and they intermingled and coal mingled and it became a totally different place after the Chinese massacre. This is a, 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 one of the people that lived there afterwards uh, after in 1890s. Okay, this is 1908 Chinatown. This is the Chinese cemetery. And what happens is the town slowly begins to be eaten up by urban development. These are Chinese houses here. Uh, this is 1903. These are Chinese restaurants right here. This is the mission house. Just, I'm sorry to repeat that again. But then you see something happen. In 1909, a school was built on top of Chinatown. A Catholic church was placed on top of it. But like in typical style, 
the Chinese houses were left there until the last Chinese person moved away. We excavated this house, Western Wyoming College excavated this house, so we have a pretty good idea of what's there. What school is that? Uh, Washington School. So this is the old Washington School. And then they tore it down in 1971. Um, and that's one period that we've got excavations. This is the Sanborn map in 1920. And by 1920, there's just these houses here that are left that are part of Chinatown. And the remaining Chinese houses are again right in this area right here, and they begin to disappear. This is the undermine. This entire area is undermined. So where you see those hallways, that's where the coal is at. And they have to infill it. And in part of the infilling, you have to drill holes. And we analyzed these holes and we monitored where these places were at. Every place you see a yellow spot here is where we found the remnants of Chinatown. It's been paved over, it's been bulldozed, it's been built upon, it's been modified, but there's still remnants of the Chinatown underneath this, uh, especially in Osage Park. Here's examples of artifacts that we found in Southwest Wyoming. This is a piece of mother pearl agate, uh, not mother pearl, it's, it's, uh, it's an, it's an agate that they cut and they made into jewelry. These are toothbrushes that they made. And literally, you can see how they're all, you know that they're hand manufactured because they're not uh, custom manufactured. And here's the die. Remember I told you about the good time, there's a pair of dice they made out of bone. If you're looking for weighted dice, I don't want anybody to go start gambling based on this lecture. But if you're looking for weighted dice, the hole is drilled in the one. And because that's where they put the lead. And all the other ones look good, but the one is just a tiny bit bigger. So they drop that piece of lead in there and you can tell if it's weighted by the size of the, the one hole and this was a weighted piece of dice. We found gold earrings and what I was telling you about the worth, they, they put it in jewelry. These are, are brass earrings that are covered with gold filigree. And when I was doing the excavations where we found these, I kept saying, there's gold in my screen. There's gold in my screen, just for you that wanna be prospectors. If it glitters, it doesn't mean it's gold. Put a shade across it, and if it's still gold underneath the shade, it's gold. If it doesn't glitter, it's not, it, I mean, if it doesn't glitter when you've got shade, it's not, but they had, they had gold jewelry inside of their houses. These are the pots that we found there. This is a soy pot right here. This is a double happiness pot. This is for like cucumbers. This is for wine. So if they're small, narrow mix like this, these are wine vessels. Okay, in the 1971 excavations inside of Chinatown, we found, they found teacups and, and soups, bowls, and they found those pots that I was just describing. Here's a double happiness pot. This is a soy pot. It's not a teapot. When I first, when I was naive and knew this, I thought it was teapot. Teas and high ceramics, because if you boil the tea in this earthenware piece, it, then it has a tendency for the tea leaf to leak inside of the, the earthenware. So this is what they transported soy into. This was like for pickles and larger things. So here you have wine bottles, soy pots, things for like pickled, uh, jars. This right here is for ornamental. It could have been done for anything. Um, in the 1991 excavations, we found uh, remnants of, of, of uh, this would be an inkwell. We found uh, this would be a, a teacup. And then we found a whole cup that would have been like a coffee cup, but not in this case. They would have bought it just like they would any other uh, utensil, and it would have been used for soups. This is on top of a floor which is kind of intriguing because they were told not to put basements in, but the first thing they did was put basements in. You can tell a person what to do, you can't make them not. <laughs> the bone that we analyzed from the Chinatown in Rock Springs is absolutely fascinating. A man by the name of Ryan Kennedy who graduated Stanford and is at Tulane at this point in time did the genetic analysis and isotopic analysis of the bones. And what we found is that they're importing fish from the Caribbean, from uh, the pike minnow from uh, uh, Sacramento, they're getting sea bass, they're getting uh, fish from China, and they're getting salmon. In. One of the most common things that we find in the Evanston Chinatown excavation is salmon in bone, not common, but we find salmon in bone, which is trout. And you could actually buy trout inside of Evanston. There was an advertisement for it in the 1870s to buy trout. And possibly it was being bought and it was being caught by the Chinese and sold there as part of the goods that they had. Chinese also own property in Wyoming, which is quite unique. So in Evanston, a man owned a farm he, and he put Chong Ditch there. Uh, China Mary bought her piece of property that she lived on and the individuals inside of town here bought their pro property. And the way, way we know this is they're paying taxes on it. In the bone that we find right here, we know something very special about the pig bone. The pigs are being fed corn and we thought that they would be free ranging pigs that they would go out and, and, and fend for themselves and that they would eat grasses. If you eat grasses that are from, um, 
our area, if you eat grasses, you're going to get C3 fixed inside of your system. If you grow corn, which evolved and was hybrid inside of the tropics, you'll get C4. So we know that these pigs were getting C4 corn. They were getting corn. They weren't eating grasses, that they weren't just out there rooting, that they were getting them to high weight real fast so that they could sell them in the restaurants that they opened up. There was a high market for it. So there was, this is something that we know. So the isotopic studies of the bone tell us more about what these, the Chinese individuals were doing. And we also know that there were pig laws made in Wyoming. Go figure. But they have pig laws that you just can't let free roaming pigs wander around the city and eat garbage because that's one way to not have to pay for feed. Um, Osei Avenue, named after the person you saw earlier, is right here at this point. When they excavated this area to put in the new Washington school, they actually exposed basements of the Chinese houses. This summer when we dug, here's the church in the background here. This summer when we dug, we dug inside of the schoolyard right here. And there's some pretty interesting things that I'll talk about. That's Catholic church. Yeah, that's a Catholic church on Bridger Avenue. It used to be called China Avenue. And then when there was no more Chinese living along here, they changed it to Bridger. And it's uh, Lincoln Highway US 30 is what it is now. Um, okay, so we excavated in five centimeter levels, but you could see the different things. So if we, if we start from the bottom, this is the 1874 to 1855 town right here. You can see the burn. There's that burn horizon through here and they leveled it. The interesting thing about this is, is if there was a house nearby, it didn't have a basement, or if this was just outside a house, it didn't, it, it had high amount of activity. We think we hit a street, and it's not bad hitting a street, but the reason we think we hit a street is you saw the large artifacts just a minute ago. We got nothing but small artifacts in this, from this horizon. I'll show you in just a moment. Most of our ceramics come from this locality right here. When it was rebuilt in 1885 to 1912, we also think it was an external space that it was an internal place. In 1909, they leveled this down again and they built the school and this construction material is mortar and sand for building the Washington School, but it might be for something else. The intriguing thing about this is, is because this was cheap property, it was bought by the Slovenians to build their church, Slovinsky, Slovinsky Domus to the uh, west. The church was built to the, to the uh, east the Slovenians settled this particular area and became what would be another migrant area, not Chinese. And that, and then in the schoolyard, whoop, in the schoolyard, whoop, we need to go back. In the schoolyard right here, this is the thickest horizon. We've got clinkers, we've got erasers, we've got kids' toys, we've got everything associated with school artifacts right here. Okay, this is the measurements that were sh to show you how deep it was to get down to that lower level. But that 1885 horizon is real clear. It's like someone took a crown and moved it all the way around. You can see where the burn horizon is. These are the artifacts we found. Now, just to give you an idea how small these are, this is one centimeter. So these are all Chinese artifacts that you see right here, but they're broken up and crushed up because they're being walked over, run over by carts uh, and by horses and by people inside of the street. So we're pretty sure that in excavations this summer, we hit the street. And this again, just proves that point that I'm trying to, to say this is like that one nice tea cup that I showed you in excavation. This is part of a tea cup right here. These are utility wares for like putting soy sauce and put for putting uh, the cucumbers in. Uh, this right here is a fine piece of decorated ware. But we just didn't find those items. We found uh, jewelry. And this jewelry right here is a tooth and it's got a drill hole through it. And this resin is used to hold like a stud on the top of it. And so they glued it in, they drilled it in there. And then they res resonated it, but this tooth was made into like a necklace piece. This is a piece from a Go game. You guys know the game Go, the Chinese game Go. It's kind of, it's not like Chinese checkers, it's more like chess, but they play, they've got black and white pieces here, but we found the, uh, a Chinese Go piece inside the excavation. In addition to that, we found this cartridge. Now, what this does is it shows us something that's evident in the Evanston Chinatown in Rock Springs Chinatown, they begin to arm themselves. This is 38 caliber. So after the massacre, they didn't just let things passively go forward. They began to arm themselves to protect themselves against some other type of, of incursion. The number of ballistics we found at Evanston is very high. And we found ballistics in the one that we excavated in 1991 that I showed you behind the school there, where I showed you that house was behind the church. We found a lot of ballistics there too. Uh, there was a change in attitude as well there would be. This summer we found um, a lot of pig bone and we found uh, uh, sea trout. So sea trout and pig bone we found in the excavation. So what happens to the Chinese? 
uh, the man that I started by talking to, Li Chung, was not only in the Chinese massacre, this is he right here, he was not only in the Chinese massacre, he was shot in the back. They could not remove that lead piece from inside so of his he's back. the third one from the right. Third one from the right, yeah, third one from the right. He had that piece of lead in there. He had to live in town with Keenan and he had to live in town with White House. He had to live in town with people that weren't arrested that he know had stolen his money and had burned his house and had shot him and he stayed. And I always, at this point in time, people get tired of hearing me. That's because unlike a lot of people, he didn't see the rock at Rock Springs, he saw the springs. <laughs> and he actually, for whatever reason, fell in love with this place. And these uh, men that left in 1925 were paid for their trip, was paid for them by the Union Pacific back to China. And they gave them $300 or $500 flat payment for the rest of their lives, that wasn't enough. And eventually they had to come back and ask for more money. And some of these guys are alive until 1932, not uh, Leo Chung. He died two years after returning home. Um, but they wrote back to the Union Pacific Company. But when they left, they had a, a banquet for them at the Grand Cafe. And at the banquet at the Grand Cafe, they got up and read one of the most beautiful speeches that I have ever seen. And as far as the simplicity goes, and it says, we have spent our life in Rock Springs. We have many friends who we are going to miss very dearly. Thank you. Now, what they are saying in my way of viewing it, and this is probably my perspective that I want to put in, we forgive you. We forgive what happened to us. And the way that you know we forgave you and that we hold no animosity to you, though we do have grief and though we do have pain and that we'll never get past what's occurred and what's happened to us is the, re the reason that we know that they cared is they stayed there, just like they would have at Shibu. They were dedicated to their village. Now there's more complexity to this than, than that. But the point is that these people were aggrieved, they were robbed, they were burned out. And as they always say, a thief leaves something, a fire leaves nothing, but basically they had both things going against them. They lost everything they had overnight. And that indemnity took three to five years to come and there is, some, there is some indication that the money was actually stolen from them that was supposed to go back to them. We still don't know. There's still some questions about it. I have to talk to my friends that are better scholars than I. In 1927, another four men were sent back. Of these men that were sent back that you see in these two pictures, eight of them had survived the Chinese massacre. Eight of them had survived the Chinese massacre. And this is where they chose to live. Now, archeology, span can tell you the things that you find. They can tell you about what people eat. They cannot tell you what's in people's hearts or what's in people's minds. And I don't know if they stayed because of the same type of dedication that they have to their home village. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they stayed because of the fact that this is where the country fellows were, but they formed a community. And in that new Chinatown, they could all gone through the same thing. They traveled through the same difficulties. In that new Chinatown, they begin to find a, a home. And one of the articles from 1925 says that since they begin to see their Chinatown be subdivided and, and gone away, they begin to lose heart. Um, and I don't know, we all get old and kind of lose heart because we're getting old, you know. But the point being is, is that the archaeology record shows specifically what happened. It shows evidence of the crime. It showed the places exactly where it is. But the historical record and the record of these, the testimony of these people going back to where they came from says a lot because like the Chinese say, like leaves falling from a tree, we must all return to our roots.